Seen the marathon, the 26 point something miles. Anybody ever run in a marathon besides me? No? Oh, you? Okay. <laughs> well, that's sort of what the message is going to be about today is um, we're going to run with endurance. So we're going to put on our spiritual running shoes and we are going to run with endurance our Christian journey of life down here. And if you would, we're going to turn, the opening one is Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2. This one we'll read together, give you a moment to find it, it's right before James. And Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 2 says this, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, would you bless this message? Would you bless us, Lord, as we break open your word? And Father, the words that come out of my mouth, I want them to be your words. Lord, would you energize us? Would you just instill in us the need to continue to study and read your word and to stand fast and run this Christian life with endurance? As Christians, though, our race is a little different than those who run in these marathons and these natural races. In those races, there's only one winner. Only one person gets the prize. The one that finishes the cross, uh, cross the finish line first, that person will get the prize. But our spiritual journey, it's different. And the winner is not who is the fastest, but who can complete the course. And that's what we need to understand. It is not a journey, a sprint, but it is a journey for the long distance. And it does take us some effort and some time to dig into the Word of God, to understand it, to study it, and then to live it. Our spiritual race, and we should also run and live our lives as Christians with endurance, and that means the ability to withstand hardship or stress in such a way as to convince those around us, those folks who don't know who Jesus is, to show them who our Lord Jesus is, to show them that our life is lining up with our mouth says. So how do we accomplish this? Well, we look to Jesus first. He's the one that we should be looking to in our Bible, in our word, about how to be a good Christian. Then we practice getting rid of the sin that trips us up. We all have that sin, no hands raised, every one of us, and we all know what that sin is that so easily entangles our feet and messes us up. We keep our eyes upon Jesus. And this means giving our unidentified attention to the Lord keeping our eyes off every distraction that can hinder our walk. In Christ, we have a peace that the world just cannot understand. But we are in a spiritual battle every day. So stay alert. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Yeah, we have an enemy. His name is the devil, the old serpent, old slew foot. Look, he can't take your soul if you were born again, spirit-filled Christian, but he can knock us off a course. He can get us off into some small tributary somewhere where we become ineffective for him and for the word of God. There are so many distractions out here, plenty of detours in the world, so we need to keep our eyes upon the Lord. Our race is a long distance race. It's not a sprint. Rather, it is a race of endurance. That is why Paul said to run this race with endurance 
and with patience. We need endurance to run this Christian life. Jesus told us the world will not be our friends. In fact, he said, we're going to be hated by the world because of our love and our obedience for Jesus. Have we not found this to be true? I get hysterical when I hear some of our politicians who outright hate what this country stands for and hate the God for which we stand for when they say they're pray praying. What nonsense. They want to do everything to get rid of God from our society. But fear, fear not, didn't God say the gates of hell will not prevail against his church? His church is going to stand when everything else is going to fall. Matthew 10, 22 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. James says in James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. All folks who run marathons need training. They don't get up one day and say, you know, next week is the marathon, 26 miles. I think I'll just, I'll, I'll put my name in and I'll do that. Uh-uh. It's a long race and the athletes know that there are many components to this training. They need to watch what they eat, how much they can eat, they need to get enough rest, and they need to get out there and run miles a day. My war injuries prevent me from running miles a day. I am not training for any kind of marathon, that's that. But they train daily, and the training goes on for months, and it could go on for years. You know, you've seen our um, athletes, uh, gymnastics. These people have been training not for months, sometimes five, eight years to win these events. Athletes need to build up their bodies and they must be mentally prepared and alert. The mental part is just as important as the physical part. So as Christians, we need also to train for the long race and not the short sprint. We must also keep our eyes upon the Lord. When we take our eyes off God, we are going to stumble. Listen, that's just a basic fact. When we keep our eyes on the Lord, when we have our face in the word of God, when we are praying daily, we're less likely to get messed up by anything. But when you lay that aside, you're in for a fall somewhere. We can't keep our eyes on both things. We can't keep our eyes on the Lord and on the world. It's just, it's impossible. You know, even church, and I've said this before, we get up in the morning sometimes, especially in the summer or springtime, and it's a nice day out, and we say, you know what? I think I'm just going to get a bagel, sit on the porch, have a cup of coffee, and just relax and we forget about God. And then the next Sunday, we forget about God. And the more you do that, the easier it is to get yourself distant from the Lord. So be alert. I mean, I've said this myself. I asked my wife, you know what? I just feel like having a cup of coffee and uh, relaxing here. I think I should do that. I said, give me one reason why I can't. And she said, well, you're the pastor of the church. You got people coming to see you. Fix your hair. Uh, I don't want to get into fixing the hair. but uh, So we all go through that at one time or another. But we want to look at some biblical principles to assist us in our training effort as we live out our Christian life. The first one I want to go over is each Christian needs to prepare for the race. Just like athletes prepare, we need to prepare. They do their preparation work for their event, and it doesn't matter what the sport is. All athletes prepare not only physically, but also mentally. As in the natural, so also in the spiritual. All Christians need to prepare themselves for their journey of faith. The Apostle Paul tells us in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1, that to prepare for our spiritual race, we must first lay aside every weight and sin 
which so easily ensnares us. I don't care what the sin is, what is the weight that is tripping us up. A friend of mine said to me one time that he will not put any kind of Christian stickers on his car because sometimes um, he may um, lose a little something when somebody cuts him off. And he's not talking about cursing, but he can jump up and down. And um, Someone else said that uh, Saturday in our men's fellowship. And it is true. If we put those stickers on, you know, people look at us and say, what? This guy just yelled at me? And I am the best driver in the world. I tell myself that. And I get excited sometimes, but then I have uh, my partner next to me telling me, it is a 95-year-old man trying to back up. <laughs> yes, you're right. So we have to be careful. Get rid of any weights, any hindrances that will slow us down or even shipwreck us. Weights and sin will not allow us to endure our Christian race. Only you know that weight or that sin that continues to cause you trouble. Now, if it's watching too much television, shut it off. You're not going to pass away. I'm telling you, shut it off. And if you're on Facebook, put it down. And if you're on that phone too long, shut it off. Yeah. Whatever happened to the days with the kid sneakers, the pensy pinky, and you go out and you play stickball and punch ball. Whatever happened to those days? Do you see our kids now? They got their face in these phones. They're walking into cars. The people are falling down the street. They're tripping up because they're not watching where they're going. Same in the spiritual. If you're not watching, if you're not keeping your eyes on the Lord, if you're not fellowshipping with good Christians and you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, watching things you shouldn't be doing, hey, and I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. Don't think I'm some angel up here. We take our eyes off God. Once we do that, watch out. Get the Band-Aids ready. Let's say you're going to run a race. And men, we show up at this race, and we're diligent. We're wearing our dress shoes, a suit, and a tie. Women, you show up at the race wearing a dress, high heels, and your fancy hat. You're going to look ridiculous at this race, number one, and you are going to lose the race. You can't run with all this garb on. And you can't run the spiritual race with all the weights and hindrances that seem to want to occupy our time. When David was going to fight Goliath, right? King Saul said he thought he was helping him out. And King Saul was a pretty tall guy. He said, put on my uh, armor. Put on my sword. So David put it on. He found out he couldn't walk more than two steps with all this stuff on. He said, I don't need it. Now, we know the story. It's in 1 Samuel 17, 38 to 39. So it says, Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with a coat of mail, armor. That's all good. David couldn't walk. If you can't walk, you can't fight. So we know the story. He goes out against Goliath with a, sl with a slingshot and five smooth stones. But more important, he went out against Goliath in the name of the Lord. And that's what we got to do. We go out into this world, and some nasty things might be said to us as Christians. Don't argue. Don't win. The, you'll never win the war of words arguing with somebody. You just say, I'll pray for you. And if you're willing to listen to me, let me tell you where I was and where I am now. Where I was was in a pit that only God could get me out of. Where I am now is 99% perfection. Uh, tell them. <laughs> no, okay, maybe 75%, maybe less. But anyway, God takes us where we are, he cleans us up, and he brings us forward. Amen to that. I know one thing, I'm not what I was, but I'm still not there yet, as Paul said the same thing. Doubting and unbelief is a spiritual hindrance or a weight for us as Christians. Example. We don't have to go far in the book of Genesis and we can read about doubt and unbelief in the third chapter. 
of Genesis. We read about the serpent saying to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? And Eve answered correctly. She said, no, we can eat of all the fruit from the trees in the garden except one. Otherwise, we're going to die. And the serpent, of course, says, come on. You're not going to die. What's wrong with you? You're going to become like God. She forgot or she didn't believe the word of God. And because of that little incident, we all have to work till we're in our 60s and maybe beyond. Folks, don't get mad at Eve. I told you this before. If there was a tree with Yankee Doodles hanging on it and God told me don't eat them, I don't think I'd last 10 seconds. So this is just the way it is. Whatever you are praying for, folks, do not give up. Is anything impossible for God? If that child is giving you some trouble and doesn't want to know what God is, or you got a sickness, or your job is in danger, or you're going to lose your job, whatever it is, believe that the Lord can get you through anything. My friend is now uh, in a rehab center. This man uh, is a walking miracle. He was without oxygen, was it 30 minutes? 30 minutes. He had all tubes coming everywhere. When you see the pictures, he, his kidneys shut down. Everything was happening to him. Well, today, he's doing physical therapy. He's eating food. He's feeling great. And they're going to release him probably within a week. Don't tell me that God cannot go through and come through for each and every one of us. We are children of the Most High God. We have our Lord Jesus, the God of the universe, who's going before us, who will take care of us. Never mind what these people are saying out, out in the street, on the news. Forget them. Keep your eyes on the Lord. He holds us in the palm of his hands. He brought us along. He's not going to let us go now that he began a good work in us. Now, how are you doing then, folks? Are you looking back into what was in the past? Drop it. Move forward in Christ. The Apostle Paul gives us good advice when he says in Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's talking about his Christian walk. And we all know that Paul went through some real difficult things. Paul went through being a persecutor and a sinner of the church to becoming a lover of Christ and a saint in the church. Paul is telling us, reach forward. Keep going for the things that are ahead. Be diligent in your going in after the goal of Christ. Keep seeking him. What is your weight that may be hindering you in your Christian journey? You can get rid of it. Give it to the Lord. You know, when I began this Christian journey, we were talking about this on Wednesday night, you know, don't be unequal yoked and this kind of stuff. We were 26 years old. We gave our hearts to Christ. I had no clue what was next. But I always said, Lord, here I am. Use me. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I did put an addendum on that. I said, Lord, I don't really feel like going to Africa. I don't want to sit in a desert somewhere. Hawaii, that's, a, that's another thing. I'll go there if you want to send me. But I took one step at a time, kept going forward, kept going, kept studying, which I'm still studying. I went to school at 30 years of age. Here I am with all these 18 and 19 year olds. Then I went to Bible school and on and on it went. I got ordained over 20 years ago. Did I ever think in my wildest dreams I'd stand up here that I was a pastor of a church leading people? No, but God is looking for availability. Not so much ability, but he's looking for availability. Yeah, we have to be intelligent in what we're doing. I don't want a surgeon operating on me that never finished high school. But you take one step towards God, he's going to take 10 steps towards you. So what the Lord is saying here is if you want to run this race, if you want to complete this race, get rid of these hindrances, get rid of these sins. What are some of the other weights that go on? Well, the love of the, law of the world is one thing. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, folks, and I wrote in my notes, brothers and sisters, the Apostle John here is not talking about loving wonderful sunsets and sunrises and our children and our grandchildren. Absolutely not. Or beautiful flowers that grow. Uh, you get the idea. Mountain ranges. He's not saying that. He's telling us to hate the world system. And that world system leaves God out of everything. And it is in true opposition to Jesus and the Bible. One Bible writer said this, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are living in a godless world that is in rebellion against God. You say amen to that? I think that's what's going on. Church, we can all have nice things. It's good to have nice cars. It's good to get in a car that you know you put the key in and it's gonna start. Now, I'm old enough, I'm over 50 now. That's a joke. Oh, there's a tough crowd here, Bob, tough crowd. I'm old enough to remember those cars. You know, where my partner, thank God, was a good mechanic. One day the radiator went, one day the transmission went. This guy could fix anything. But now these cars today, what do you have to do with them? Put gas in them. You don't even have to change the antifreeze for 100,000 miles. Yes, they cost 15 times more than the car that when I was a kid, but they run a lot better. So we can have nice things. It could be nice to have a nice TV and a nice home and nice clothes, uh, but don't let things have you. That's where we run into trouble. Sin is another item that the writer of Hebrews writes us about. That sin that so easily trips us up. Sin is a hindrance to doing God's work, and it is a distraction for us so we can get off the course that the Lord wants us to be on. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Demas, his co-worker had left him. He, he writes this in Tim, 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonia. Demas, he loved the world more than he loved Christ, and he left. Demas loved this world more than Jesus. Demas is mentioned in Colossians and Philemon. He was a fellow worker with Paul and Mark. Stay alert, church. We can never be satisfied in our Christian race until we get rid of every weight and sin that keeps us back from the Lord. Okay, now that Paul gives us instructions on getting rid of all of these things, and now we want to know how are we going to please the Lord. He's going to tell us how to run this race. Second point is how to run the Christian race. First, we must look to Jesus and not ourselves. I know we're all good looking here. We all get dressed. We're all doing fine. Look to the Lord first. Our emotions can and do deceive us. But Jesus and his word will always be beneficial to us. And his word and Jesus will never lead us in a path that will be destruction for us. He's always truthful and he only wants the best for us. And remember what James said, not James Yakko, uh, the Texan now. I'm talking about James in the book of James. He said, every good gift comes from the Father above. He doesn't give us all this sickness. We happen to be living in a world full of sin and godlessness. Never was to be this way. But it is now, but it doesn't come from God. Where does it come from? The evil one. Do you ever feel alone that you have no strength to go on? Zechariah 4, 6 says this. Not by might nor by power, but by spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not your power. It's not what, how smart you are or how brave you are or what your IQ is or what you can do. It's not by your spirit. It's by the spirit of God who lives in us and works through us that will get us through. We're never alone when we have Jesus with us. Maybe the battle is getting to you, but remember the scripture. It is not your power or any army. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, will give you the power, will give you the words when you need it and at the right time you need it. Ephesians 3.20 says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we 
Ask or think according to the power that works in us. I just said what power is in us? The Holy Spirit. He'll do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever think. Jesus gives us this power in the spiritual. We have divine ability. We have spiritual power overflowing in us. We have God's power working in us. We are not the old man anymore. We are not what we used to be, no matter when your old friends come, and sometimes that gets me scared, and they say, hey, you remember what he was? No, no, that's what I was. This is what I am now. We are new creations in Christ. We have Jesus' DNA in our blood. Colossians 1.29 says, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working power, which works in me mightily. Paul knew that he was weak in his flesh. We are weak in our flesh, but mighty in God's spirit working in us. We are no different than Paul. We also have the Holy Spirit's power living in us. Paul messed up, we messed up. Paul is on the road to glory and so are we. When we face the enemy, and we will face the enemy, remember who you are in Christ and that the word of God tells us that we have spiritual power. Remember James 4, 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Many Christians quote this one by saying, resist the devil and he will flee from you. They misquote the scripture, just as Satan said to Jesus, and he mentioned Deuteronomy and stuff. He misquoted these scriptures. You've got to submit to God. Do not go against anything unspiritual unless you are prayed up and full of God's spirit in you. Stand firm when dealing with the enemy, and he will flee from you. Hold on to that. Unbelief in the Lord will weaken us and will weaken a nation that has no belief in Jesus. Eventually, that individual or that nation will become cowards in the spiritual. No strength to fight spiritual battles. This is a great saying. President Ronald Reagan said this, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Amen to that. That is the absolute truth. These pundits that want to take everything away in, in what we believe in, in our God, in our Bible, and what we do for the Lord, they want to take it all away. And you know what? I'm on the back nine. I really am. But I fear at times for our children and grandchildren what this nation is becoming if we allow these people to obtain office. Maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, uh, but you know what? I'm going to stand up for my God rather than someone tell me we don't need religion. This country was founded on the principles of the word of God. It will continue on the principles of the word of God. Make no mistake about that, folks. Amen? Let's give the Lord a, a, a round of applause. Yes. When Joshua was near the end of his life, he told Israel, go into the promised land and possess it. Why? Because God gave it to them as an inheritance. When God gives you something, take it. It's a promise, and God cannot break his promises. We can break the promises. We can turn our backs on the Lord, but God is ever-present in our lives, ever-present in what we're doing. Where would we be without the love of Jesus in our life? Folks, I'm telling you, I was 26 years old when I got saved. Boy, oh boy, I wish I was 10 years old when I got saved. 44 years I'm walking with the Lord. 44 years I'm studying and reading the Bible, and I know this much in a room this big. I'm not going to pat myself on the back, but I continue, even though I'm not pastoring full-time anymore, I continue to do these messages. This one here, I was just... had a thought and started putting down some thoughts, and next thing I know, Pastor Steve says, you got anything? Yeah, okay, you're up. All right, I'm up, okay. Um, when, when you do this enough, it... The joy is getting into the Word of God. The joy is studying what God has for us. Joshua 23.10 says, One man of you shall chase a thousand, 
For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Yes, God will fight for us as he promised. Joshua, Joshua was successful because he obeyed and he believed the word of God for his life. Same for you and me today. We serve the same God. You know what? I heard, I heard something, guys. You know what? Our God hasn't changed in 100,000 years. He will never change. I got that from my friend. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's not worried about anything. He's got everything under control, and so we shouldn't worry either as long as we keep our eyes on the Lord. There are so many promises that God has given us, and I would like to read one that is found in the Gospel of John 11, 25 to 26. This is a, I use this at wakes. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believe in me shall never die. But there is the line. If we believe in Jesus, we're all going to die physically, every one of us. It's where do we go after this? We're either going up or we're going down. If you are a Christian and you are serving the Lord and you love the Lord, you're going up, folks. Your ticket was punched the day you said, I believe in you, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to live forever with him. Another Bible writer said this, it isn't enough to know the word of God. We must also know the God of the word and grow in our fellowship with him. We are in the school of Jesus. It never ends and we never really graduate. We continue to study and learn his word. The flesh profits us nothing. Folks, that's why I don't work out. The Bible says that Working out, I'm paraphrasing here, profits you nothing. No good. But relying on the word of God and not ourselves will profit us great gain. John 6, 63, Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. When we accept the Lord Jesus as our savior, we become a member of God's family. And God will see you and I through until he calls us home. Look to Jesus for our strength and not ourselves. That's an easy statement to say. It is. Yes, it is easy. And it can be hard not to look to ourselves, but we need to look to the Lord first. But when we look upward toward Jesus, we have victory. If we look at ourselves, we have defeat. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We get the victory. I didn't say we're not going to go through skirmishes and battles. But when it's over, we are going to get the victory because Christ promised it to us. This is a spiritual victory that we are talking about here. And when it comes to victory in Jesus, remember, Jesus has already given us the spiritual victory. So we do not fight for victory we fight from victory. So we run our race down here on this earth from victory to victory, and we're going to meet our goal. We're going to get to the finish line, which will be Jesus. The last point, where your eyes go will make all the difference in our race. Look towards Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Stay alert. The devil is a master at deception and delusion. And he'll always try to trip us up. We can also be deceived once we take our eyes off the Lord. Look to the finish line where Jesus is. You remember, a runner, when he's running a race, doesn't constantly turn around like this. Oh, they're coming on me. No, he's running. Even uh, when they do these uh, Indy 500s, they're all hooked up with mics now. And the, the pit crew is telling the driver, you know, somebody's 50 yards behind you, whatever. But a runner doesn't have this stuff. He just keeps running. He keeps us, his eyes on, or her eyes on the goal, the finish line. Once you turn around, you're lost. The devil will always try to bring up your past. You can't do anything about your past. You can't change it, so don't live there. You are a child of God. You are a new creation in Jesus. And as I end this message today, Run your Christian race with endurance. The world will bring storms and disappointments, 
but Jesus will always provide his wisdom, strength, and peace to us. So my question is, are you preparing and are you doing what you need to do to run this race for Jesus? Are you trying to get rid of these hindrances, these sins, the weights? They're all meant to distract us from the finish line. The second thing is run this race of faith with Jesus and not our emotions. It's not by our power, but it is by God's power. Third, keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, when you're driving a car, you don't take your eyes off the road. I hope you don't. Keep your eyes on the road, because once you take your eyes off the road, even to talk to the person next to you or behind you, it only takes a nanosecond, and you got trouble. Keep your eyes firmly fixed ahead of you. I was telling one of the guys here, he's an engineer for the Long Island Railroad, I say, Lou, sorry, Lou, keep your eyes what's in front of you. This is an important task he has. You got hundreds of people that you're responsible for. Take the cell phone, put it in your locker. You don't need it. And that's what we need to do in our race also. Keep our eyes firmly fixed on the Lord. Prepare for the race. As you run the Christian race, keep your eyes upon Jesus. Remember to stay faithful even when the darkness comes, even when the storms of life pound upon your house. We win, folks. Our joy as Christians does not depend on any external circumstances because our joy is built upon Jesus Christ, the foundation and the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen?